What's up guys, Brandon here, and it's that time of year where many college students, or heck, maybe even high school students, or heck, maybe even middle schoolers? Is that how young that's going now? Anyway, they're all headed back to school and are looking for a new piece of sweet apple goodness to help them through all the homework and projects and other stuff bound to mess up their lives. If you're heading back to school or even need something for your side business or for some extra fun and entertainment that's portable, there's no doubt that there's a wide array of Apple devices to choose from. When Apple launched their first iPad in 2010, those in the market have had the good fortune of asking themselves whether an iPad or a MacBook might be right for them. Now, over the years, there have been a few models in the laptop category, such as the MacBook, MacBook Air, and the MacBook Pro. This similar model of good, better, best has also made its way into the iPad lineup with the iPad, iPad Air, and the iPad Pro. In this video, I'll go over the main things to consider in making your decision. Stay to the end, and I'll give you my personal recommendation on which device I would go with if I had to do school all over again. Ugh. Portable options. First, let's go over what our options are in the MacBook and iPad space. Now, the regular MacBook no longer exists and the regular iPad compared to the iPad Air is now the underdog in a few ways where I might not recommend it anymore as it has less keyboard and pencil options and perhaps most importantly, does not come with an M1 or M2 chip, which is what Apple has upgraded all these other devices to with the new Apple Silicon, which I'll get to in a little bit. So let me simply say this for you. In the portable space, you are either looking at the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro on the laptop side, or the iPad Air or the iPad Pro in the tablet space. In this video, I will focus mostly on the laptop versus tablet argument. And once you have made your decision on which route you want to go, I'll let you decide what your preferences are and where your credit card leans as there can be a fairly significant price difference between all the options. Reasons to buy iPad. If you are looking for the most flexibility, a tablet may be for you, and today's options have plenty to offer. When the first tablets came out, we didn't have pencils or magnetically detachable keyboards with built-in trackpads and extra USB-C charging ports that doubled as the case, but now they can almost act as a laptop themselves. An iPad, unlike a phone, isn't something you have to physically hold to use, but you can. The iPad is perfect for relaxing on the couch or as a passenger in the car, especially if you are doing things like scrolling YouTube or playing a game. If you want to get down to business, however, you can station the iPad on a desk and angle it just like a laptop screen. The keyboards over the years have made great strides with feedback to your fingers and great durability versus the rubber or cloth covered buttons of past iterations. Let's not forget the obvious bonus of having a touch screen. Now, while there are touchscreen laptops in the market, you will not currently find that in Apple's offerings, and according to their leadership, we may never have it. The bonus of a big touchscreen sitting before you on that iPad is you can easily scroll and navigate apps and web pages with your fingers. They can become tools as you stretch photos or zoom out on a camera. This has become second nature with the evolution of the touchscreen phone. As noted earlier, the Magic Keyboard, which I highly recommend for the iPad, features a trackpad which expands your options. Sometimes if the iPad is extended out in front of me and I'm reading through longer content, being able to rest your palm on a table and use two fingers to scroll versus holding your arm up to utilize a touchscreen is a welcome break and offers better ergonomics. Speaking of better ergonomics, I simply couldn't imagine buying an iPad without a detachable keyboard, especially in the school or work setting as I've never really been keen on using the on display keyboard for anything longer than quick text responses or entering in a password. If you are going the iPad route, I strongly recommend the Magic Keyboard from Apple, and though at a premium, definitely over their Smart Keyboard Folio, which lacks enough adjustability, a trackpad, charging port, and more premium keys. Lastly, on iPad-specific pros is the Apple Pencil. If you want to handwrite notes into the multitude of note-writing apps, draw diagrams or mind maps, annotate PDFs or whiteboard sessions, the Pencil is going to be your best friend. While you can use your fingers for many of these actions, over time you will be let down greatly with the lack of precision and options, which of course the Pencil delivers. And the Apple Pencil from both hardware and software has come a long way. No longer do you have to pull off a cap and plug it into a lightning cable to charge it as it now magnetically attaches to the iPad and wirelessly charges. This means you can always have it with you and fully charge, which adds to the utility of your device. 
If you are drawn on an image, you can double tap the pencil to automatically switch between the eraser and then back to the pencil, considerably speeding up your workflow. And frankly, sometimes I just use the pencil as a navigation tool to scroll web pages or click links when I want to give my fingers a break. Reasons to buy MacBook. If you are looking for the most power or perhaps the most compatibility with legacy apps, a MacBook may be the way to go. A key note, if going back to school or even in the new job where you can bring your own device, you'll want to check to see if there are any specific app or operating system requirements. For example, I've known a few friends going through engineering school and they use PC only apps. Blech. A MacBook brings familiarity in both the form factor and operating system for most people. For example, personally, I'm more equipped to easily handle Photoshop or Final Cut Pro on a MacBook versus an iPad, even though both are getting quite similar. I also think about file management or having multiple users, things that the iPad just doesn't do well or even at all. Now with the MacBook, you won't be able to use an Apple Pencil, but the keyboard is already included, and it's a good one. Between illuminated keys, more travel and a wider layout, the keyboard with its larger neighboring trackpad are more ergonomic and usable. If you need to do heavy typing, essay after essay, you would definitely appreciate the better keyboard. But as I'll explain in a minute, there are options around that for the iPad as well. A MacBook, especially for the MacBook Pro, when spec'd out is an absolute powerhouse. Take it from me. If you want to be editing and rendering multiple streams of 4K content while having Safari loaded with 40 tabs and Photoshop open and whatever else, the computer will hum along without missing a beat. If you're into animation, gaming, any of the creative pursuits, you will generally find the MacBook the most satisfying. Relatedly, if you desire extra ports, whether headphones, HDMI, multiple USB-Cs, even a card reader for you photographers, something like the MacBook Pro is going to be the best option. Luckily, thanks to tech like AirDrop and AirPlay and even the countless dongles and USB hubs out there, none of this has to be a problem for your workflows with any iPad or MacBook option except for those really unique circumstances. Other comparison factors. There are many ways the iPad and MacBook are similar and different, and this continues to evolve over time. For example, with the new M chips in the iPad, there is now the ability to extend your desktop to a second display versus mirroring your display with past chips. For the new 15-inch MacBook Air, it can also run a single external display, whereas a spec'd out MacBook Pro can run up to four displays over Thunderbolt. So ask yourself, what sort of horsepower are you looking for when it comes to multitasking and having lots of screen real estate? As I covered earlier, while the MacBook Air and Pro come stock with stronger trackpad and keyboard offerings, both the iPad and MacBook can easily pair external mice, trackpads, and keyboards to customize your experience. So back to my earlier example of having to crush through multiple essays. If you had your iPad docked up at a reasonable eye level or it had it connected to an external monitor while paired with an external mouse and keyboard, your experience could almost be indistinguishable from that of the MacBook. Really, it will probably come down to the apps or even websites that you are using, which brings me to my next point. My first point is with browsers, since they may be where you spend a very large percentage of your time with work or school. There was a time when using a browser such as Safari or Chrome was a frustrating experience on the iPad. Many more unique situations like ordering something online like concert tickets or browsing the interactive features on a car maker's website were next to impossible. Sometimes a browser would load the mobile version of the website and even requesting the desktop version didn't work as expected. In recent years, however, Apple has truly made Safari desktop class as far as features, performance, and how it handles web pages. At the same time, most of the world has now optimized their websites for tablet display and no longer is the middle ground between the website you see on a mobile phone versus a desktop computer so quirky. As far as apps, the iPad brings some interesting considerations. Now, you could certainly use Microsoft Word as an app on an iPad or MacBook. You could also load the online version, Office 365, on a browser window. All of these options will work great. But take YouTube, for example, or Mint for managing your finances, or a whole host of other options. With the iPad, you can have dedicated apps, just like on your iPhone. And so you need to ask yourself if you like viewing videos or bank account info or Facebook or whatever the case may be, better within a browser window or with an app. Generally, apps can be just a smidge nicer, especially from large, well-established companies because the experience is tailor-built for your screen and device. Designers generally implement a cleaner user experience with buttons and actions while making the best use of white space 
they don't have to account for on monitors of all sizes. As we cover apps and browsers, ask yourself how much multitasking you need to do. How quickly do you need to be able to switch between apps and what type of learning curve are you willing to put up with? On a MacBook, it is incredibly easy to have many apps open and access any of them on the dock. You can lay with precision windows all over your screen at any size and jump between desktops with a couple keyboard shortcuts or trackpad gestures. Truly the way to go for a power user. The iPad, well, let's just say iPad OS has been a journey and we are slowly getting there. Changing apps with a drag from the bottom bar is not bad, and using Split View to have two apps open side by side is pretty effortless after you drag an app from your dock alongside another app you have open. You can also enable Stage Manager where you can mostly move and resize windows and group similar things together for quick access. My experience with Stage Manager right now is lukewarm and likely only the most dedicated folks who are willing to make it work will find comfort in using it. At least for me, it's taxing enough on the brain where Stage Manager and multitasking on the iPad could have its own video on how to use it. But in the end, things are doable and Apple continues to make big strides with the experience in every iteration of iPad OS. Now shifting focus to some remaining physical differences. When looking at the cameras, both the iPads and MacBooks offer typical built-in selfie webcams. Do a FaceTime or Zoom call or whatever your heart desires, these cameras continue to improve and will do a fine job for the task at hand, especially with a newer feature called Center Stage, which uses machine learning to keep you in the middle of the shot as you move around. If you need external cameras on the back of the device, the iPad is your only option. The iPad Air will come with one 12 megapixel wide camera, whereas the iPad Pro will come with that as well as an additional 10 megapixel ultra wide lens. Note that both can shoot up to 4K video. So the elephant in the room is that you'll likely always have your phone on you, which already has its own capable cameras. But just imagine you're in class and you have your iPad propped up and you need to take a short video or a photo. The iPad on an adjustable magic keyboard is almost sort of a perfect way for getting that steady shot. Or let's say you're working with a group and you want to take a quick snapshot of a whiteboard session and begin annotating it with your Apple Pencil. You can just do it, whereas with a phone, there would be a few more steps in between. Lastly, for physical differences is the size. Now I would visit the Apple website if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of size and weights, but for MacBook Air and the MacBook Pros, you will have a number of options between 13 and 16 inch screen sizes and a number of iPad options ranging from around 11 to 13 inches. If you're going the iPad route, don't forget you will likely be adding a case or a wraparound keyboard, which will also increase the thickness and weight. A 16-inch MacBook Pro is going to bring a typical modern laptop weight and size, though it's beautiful how they have streamlined these devices into their current form factors. If you want a laptop and are worried about size and weight and have never picked up a 13 or 15-inch MacBook Air, I think you'll be shockingly surprised how they can disappear in a laptop sleeve of a backpack. While my own MacBook Air is an older generation, the concept is pretty much the same and you can make it carry just like a cased-up iPad. Pricing. Again, right now, I am talking about the best devices that I think would work for most people, which is the Air and Pro version of both the iPad and MacBook. So cheaper, but perhaps more compromised options exist if you need to find something for less money. The iPad Air will start at $599, while the iPad Pro will start at $799 and goes up with things like screen size and the amount of onboard storage you want. But don't forget that if you want to take advantage of all that iPad has to offer, you could be looking at another $129 if you went with the second generation Apple Pencil and $299 for the Magic Keyboard, which is the one I recommend. Though again, cheaper options certainly exist. If you bought the cheaper iPad Air and added both accessories, you are looking at a little over $1,000. So unfortunately, these things do add up and may be a little hard on the wallet. On the other hand, you can get a MacBook Air for less than $100 more and it obviously goes up from there as you increase things like storage or screen size or go to the Pro model. Those students, don't forget, you get a healthy education discount that you should take advantage of through Apple. As for everyone else, depending on where you work, you may also get a business discount and Apple also has special discounts for folks like veterans. Thank you for those who are serving or have served. Wrap up and recommendation. For the most part, I don't think you can really lose. Both the iPad and the MacBook lines are quality products that work very well, have excellent battery life, beautiful displays, are durable, and should provide years of use. 
The new line of M chips provide crazy speed with low power usage and have literally changed the game. Again, you can find these in the new Air and Pro models of both the MacBook and iPad. And if the time comes to sell, generally these retain their value well compared to products from other brands. And as promised, here is my recommendation. Now I've owned the Mac Studio desktop computer, 15 and 16 inch MacBook Pros, the MacBook Air, multiple regular and pro iPads, and so I feel like I have enough experience with each device. However, more and more when people are asking me which laptop to get, I find myself telling them, what about the iPad? That's right. For most people for school or play who may already have dedicated machines for their job if working, I would tell them to get the iPad. And though a bit pricier, I would be directing them to either an 11 or 12.9 inch iPad Pro with the Apple Magic Keyboard. The M2 chip coupled with the RAM and storage with their iPad operating system makes this a killer laptop replacement for work and other demanding professional and creative tasks. The ability to draw is welcome and the fact that you can rip the iPad off its magnetic case and curl up on the couch with a slim piece of metal and glass and read a book or watch Netflix or scroll the social network of your choice on something other than a tiny phone screen is refreshing. Consider it sort of the jack of all trades. For the iPad Pro, add in Face ID, four speakers versus two on the air, a better quality screen. This device is just the bee's knees. So that's it. Let me know in the comments if you like this video and what device you are leaning towards. For followers of this channel, you may have realized this is kind of my first quote tech video as I'm continuing the YouTube experiments. For new people, consider subscribing if you are interested in Apple technology and how it may be used in your everyday life. Thanks for watching and until next time.